So the thing that shocked me the most about my near-death experience, and feel free to ask questions or pop in, was really those first few moments outside of my body. And I was taken in for emergency surgery, spinal surgery. I was in a bad car wreck and waited a long time and had a lot of internal injuries. And sometime during the surgery, my back was already open, my hip was open because they were taking blood from that area. I popped out of my body somewhat to the right and I could see the whole room, the doctor's heads and my body on the table. And I was excited for some reason. I was just amazed that my consciousness felt so intact and so whole. And I knew immediately that this was not a dream. This was not a hallucination. And so everything that everyone throws at me, I'm like, in those first few moments, I knew this was a reality because I was seeing the room. I was listening to the radio. I was watching what the doctors are doing. And then on top of it, there were these amazing angels in the room that were about nine feet tall. And I had, yeah, I'd read the Bible and grown up in a Christian home, but I had no concept for large light beings that were so intelligent and communicated at this fast rate and gave me so much information. So those that moment became the title of my book, Angels in the OR, because I was so shocked by those angels. That blew me away. And that was just the very first moment. And I wasn't technically dead, I guess. That would be an out-of-body experience at that point because the angels began working on me and my spirit. They were sending light through the back of the doctors and into my body on the table. And then my heart flatlined. And when I knew that sound, <laughs> that beeping sound, I knew I was dead and I didn't want to watch them revive me. And the spirit form can just go through walls. So I went through walls and I ended up in the hallway. My stepdad was getting a candy bar. Later, I verified that he indeed got that exact candy bar. So my near-death experience has been studied a lot because of that verifiable detail. Yeah. And I mean, you don't often see small details like that. Yeah, and in the moment I wondered, why did I see it? And now I know that I am I was an agnostic. I'm such a skeptic, and I knew that I was surrounded by skeptics, so I think I was given that moment just to have that moment, <laughs> you know, right. to have a verifiable mm -hmm. fact. And so do, you, do you think you were kind of um, pushed off in that direction towards your dead? I think so, because I spent some time looking at him, you know, almost the way a ghost would look at someone. I looked at him and I thought, I don't know him that well. My mom had just married him and I thought, oh, I hope he's good to her if I'm, I'm dead and hope they have a good life. And, you know, I just kind of considered him for a moment because I'd have met him once or twice at that point. And I think, I think I was meant to, and I didn't understand why at the time, but I felt like God was with me and from a far away point at that point, almost like a thread. And then as I left the hospital and I began to feel this oneness with other people, I felt even closer to God. And then as I did the life review, God was definitely there. And when I say God, I just mean this higher intelligence that yeah. was like a you light. You have to put a label on it somewhere and it's difficult. Yeah. Most it people is. do default to God or source or something like that. They mean the same thing. Yeah, yeah, but it was just an intelligent light source that was streaming towards me and uh, comforting and I, I had no fear and I knew that I was fine, you know, I was connected to this source and I, I learned lessons in the life review and then I, uh, really about being non-judgmental and what was so powerful about the near-death experience is certain moments would slow down so I would hear words like love is all that matters and that was somewhere in, in that life review or before it or after it. And and that statement, love is all that matters. It, it was meant to like go deep inside of me. And I was meant to hold on to this and meant to bring this back. So I think in that realm, that timeless realm, sometimes we're given a lot of information and it's hard to hold on to it all. But some things like that are just timeless wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> you know? given more energy than, than the others. Yeah, and remind yeah. them to go to nature was another one of my messages and be like a little child. So those were my three messages. And of course, that third one is somewhat reminiscent of Jesus and biblical. And and that was a those three statements were incredibly comforting and ones I would ponder over for many years later of how to how to incorporate that into my life and help other people incorporate it into their lives. And the biggest question and I'm sure you've encountered this if you've been on discussion boards. People always say, well, love. Well, I'm not loved. Nobody loves me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. 
And I'm like, no, 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 it's about you just being love, you know, like loving your cup of coffee, loving the squirrel mm. out on the tree, loving the tree, loving yourself. And, and I think from what I gather, it's it's a different kind of definition of love to what we, we used to experience. It's kind of beyond our current experience of what we define as love. It's yeah. more kind of um, compassion, I think, would probably be a better word. That's... But on a much higher level. Yeah, compassion, joy, connection, empathy, being there for others. And, you know, when you look around this world, there's a ton of narcissism. I don't know if that plays out in Europe as much as it plays out in, you know, the capitalistic, materialistic. Oh, I think it's, I think it's all over the place now. It's less so in the East, I find, but definitely in the Western central countries, it's ridiculous now. Human, the human race is the be all and end all of, of life, etc. Yeah, that narcissism is what the near-death experience kind of flips around and shows you the perspective of yeah. nature and animals and others and That's your right. connection. I mean, I had kind of a similar thing when I was um, suicidal with depression. When you get to that level, you're kind of forced into a different viewpoint because you're so humbled at that point that you begin to see things in a different way. Yeah, so that's... Oh, I kind of want to come back to that or either talk about that because that's yeah, sure. part of my story too. Um, I don't know if, if you know that, but I tried to commit suicide about six months before mm -hmm. my near-death experience. And for you, uh, did you did you have a spiritual awakening because of it? or? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was never kind of... I, I wouldn't have ever followed through and actually killed myself because I was too... Fr I had um, anxiety and still do terribly over death and what, what happens after so I wouldn't have, have done that but from that kind of point of where life gets that bad where you feel that you're trapped you kind of it, it kind of pushed me into more looking into this kind of thing as opposed to just kind of accepting that because back then I was very very materialistic science you know once you die you die forever and I was 12 or 14 at this time uh, in fact when did I have my breakdown when I was 16 but I'd had it for a while before then the anxiety and uh, kind of that breakdown pushed me towards kind of looking more into it as opposed to just accepting what I didn't know, which is oh. why I'm why I'm here. That it wasn't as such as a spiritual awakening. It was just more a shift in in lifestyle, I suppose, or viewpoint. Yeah, and that is a shift in energy. Like, if there's one message I try to get to kids that age when I work with them is try something different in that moment you know go outside and sit under a tree and just like breathe in that tree or uh try to do one thing like when when you're depressed and highly anxious and in one of those negative states and i i suffer with that too you can't just switch and be happy it's almost toxic joy if someone comes up to you and says oh, oh just sorry. be happy it's, it's awful <laughs> it really is yeah and it's something you can't describe to people isn't it so what you can do though is reach for the next better feeling so if you're if you're just miserable and horribly sad you can reach for one thing you know a netflix show or a piece mm. of pie or you know just a walk or something that's something, gonna make you yeah. feel just a tad bit better if you can reach for just a tad bit better then you kind of walk yourself back out of it and mm. walk yourself into it and young people sometimes don't have that skill but as you get older you know okay I'm yeah miserable. yeah I'm miserable right now but i'm gonna walk myself out of it but i keep throwing it out there that that there's got to be quicker healing too because that power of god in my near-death experience which i eventually ended up near i i do this exercise where i try to bring that power of god into those moments sometimes i've shifted them automatically so it happens really well in, in nature sometimes, but say I'm just like really upset with the situation. I go and I pray and I feel that love of God just filter fully like an energy into every bit of my body and literally pick up that whatever it is, just like a ball of negative energy, move it aside. And then, then it's like, it's not even there. Hmm. I think it's, it's a difficult thing because, you know, when, when you have an experience such as, such as yours, I think whether it kind of opens your brain up more to be able to um, receive this this kind of stuff. But to most people, I think it's that that kind of experience is just kind of one phase out of their experience, and it takes an experience like yours to be able to just kind of shift into that level of awareness. I think so, but that's why I'm trying to get younger people to try some energy workers and to try mm. some modalities because maybe they can be shifted and 
yeah, that's a, gonna be a huge push for me. I, I recently had a brain spotting uh, episode or brain spotting um, session and it's amazing. It's much like uh, rapid eye release EMDR where they work with trauma and they take you back to one moment and then kind of release that trauma and they do it with athletes right. or anyone who's suffered any kind of trauma. But it's kind it of worked. like a sort of hypnotherapy kind of thing. Yeah, and I think young people might think, oh, I've just got to go to therapy, your medication, and these traditional routes, and yeah. it's generally the older crowd that's trying these spiritual things, but I've found much greater healing with some things like Psyche and past life regressions and regressions and mm. EMDR and all kind of spiritual techniques, even Reiki when the Reiki worker is really good, that I want younger people to maybe try something that's even a little science-based, like the, the rapid right. eye release. I think the difficult thing is trying to push through these kind of predetermined understandings or beliefs about what's real and what's not. Because a lot of this thing, a lot of these things, I think it's down to if you're open minded enough, it will be more effective than if you're just closed minded, which will then kind of concrete further your belief that it's nonsense. I mean, I went to. I went to a Reiki session for the first time with a, go, a woman called Christina, Ash, Christina Ashton who's been doing it a while and I, I was very sceptical about this sort of stuff, energy stuff, I suppose being of a scientific background, but what really kind of made me think about it was the amount of heat that Christina's hands were generating and you could feel it with, with your eyes shut, you could tell where, where her hands were. It was like she was kind of acting as a radiator, it was a completely unnatural amount of heat. And it makes you, it really has to make you start wondering how that's possible. And I suppose it's just getting over that. And um, we already know how all this works nonsense. Yeah. And then you don't have to know how it's all working out, too. That I tell people to just start the healing journey and try a bunch of different things. And, and you know, you'll find something that you connect with and feel eventually. And who knows? I, I mean, my, my approach was kind of. I was curious, so I tried a lot of things, and I had a lot of trauma too, but I know that that 10 year period in my life where I worked on these things, there there came a time when all that healing work was cumulative, and where I felt this release and this return back to some of those insights of the near-death experience, and and it's, it was really, it, it was a profound shift. So yeah, there's, we also know, I think, near-death experiencers that, you know, saw the angels sending energy through the back of the doctors, and that was a reality to me. So mm -hmm. even if you don't even believe in a practitioner, I think sometimes you can pray for your angels to just work through them. <laughs> hmm. I think as well, kind of um, from what I've seen, a lot of people will dismiss this kind of experience because it's always slightly different to each person and therefore it's hallucination. But I think the way I look at that is it's more kind of an experience which is objectively real but is tailored more to your personality so it will differ slightly like some people will, will, will um, have a near-death experience and see Muhammad if they're um, in their in, in the Islam faith some people will see Jesus some people will see nothing and will just not be existent throughout that period and I think it's more tailored to how you expect to see it which doesn't make it unreal it just makes it more comfortable for you well, there's an energy and a consciousness that survives, and I think we do participate in that realm. And I, I won't weigh in about people who don't have them. Maybe they're not meant to have them you know, at mm. that time. I think that it would—it's just not fated for them to have or, that. Or even maybe they've had them, but they've just not remembered they've had them. Like you do with dreams, you have a dream and you forget it, and then you never think about it again. Doesn't mean it didn't I, happen. Yeah, I don't know. They might have to be regressed. I can't weigh in on, on that, but I can weigh in on, I had control over my form, my spiritual form. And it seemed like my grandfather, when I met him in that heavenly landscape, had some control over a few things. So I decided instead of being like 22 year old Trisha in spirit, I was going to be like a little child. And so I picked the mm -hmm. spirit form of five and I shrunk into, you know, mm -hmm. this five year old spirit. And that to me showed me that well, I can decide to go through a wall, I can decide to go here. There's a certain amount of choice even in that realm. Mm. And there's a choice to go to God or not God, to go to God, to go back. Yeah. You know? And I, I know a lot of things, especially as, as well around the outer body experience, all says the same thing, that when you're in those levels of reality, everything's very much more malleable to thought. 
Yeah, instantly. And we play out a little slower here in this realm, but I know that that experience taught me some things about manifestation. I, some things that kind of shocked me. If you're if you're curious, you know mm -hmm. that's a kind of a weird topic. But um, but yeah, that that realm was one that I participated in. My grandfather, since he looked so young in form when I met him in that heavenly landscape, he he was in a truck that I knew. And mm -hmm. so most people say that's weird. Why would you have a truck in heaven? Well, I wouldn't have recognized him without it. And he without knew it. right. That's it. Yeah. He knew that I liked to ride in the back of this truck so that's mm -hmm. what i did for a while in heaven <laughs> you know as, as a kid it's just ride in this truck and let my feet run through the grass and it was so beautiful and so peaceful and then he asked me if i wanted to continue to god and of course the best experience of any near-death experience is that the closer you get to god the more whole and complete and real you feel there is no anxiety there is no depression i mean you are loved so deeply but here's another aspect of it you're safe to love fully too like god is a mm -hmm. safe person to love we walk around this life and we kind of have and we have to out of self-protection we, we can go into relationships friendships and romantic ones with some trust and mm -hmm. then we observe that person and we think well how much can i trust them can i trust them a little more um, do I need to pull back a little and have some better boundaries? And that's that's kind of the dance here. But to be able to love and be supported and protected, and I could give all of my love to God, and God could just fill me completely with love. That's an unreal feeling, and it's it's hard to come back after that. I have to tell you. Mm. I'm sure it kind of makes you feel somewhat homesick or or very trapped. I mean, that's that's how I felt when I started looking and finding that there's probably more to to life and much more freedom than, than the human experience. You feel very trapped. Yeah, and I felt like I would be interacting with a lot of people who were trapped and didn't understand this and didn't understand that, that mm. God was so deeply loving and so deeply merciful and not this judgmental, mean God that so many people's parents are. You know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the God of, of a lot of the Bible as well, which yeah. to, to me has been very tainted over the years. Yeah, I think it was Mary Neal who said something interesting, who, was, who said, people ask her about the Bible a lot, and she said, well, imagine if something was translated from Spanish, you know, great wisdom from thousands mm. of years ago, would you follow it literally? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is years and years and years and years ago when people probably weren't as mentally or intelligently evolved as we are so how can we take their literal translations as as truth you know they wouldn't have had the means and methods that we do now even which is still very much inaccurate to a lot of dis descriptions yeah well, we can take the heart of it the truth the spiritual truth the mm. kind of like the near-death experience gives those moments like be like a little child love is all that matters that's just an mm. essence of a spiritual truth you know there's there's logic, there's fact, and then there's this higher realm, which is just essential truth. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're looking for essential truths, that they're simple. Mm. And it's something that can only be experienced, not worked out, isn't it? Yeah, and worked out over time sometimes that I, it took these lessons a long time to work themselves out in my life. <laughs>